And I guess I just want to preface this with, I personally have nothing against Bitcoin or cryptocurrencies. Uh, in fact, it's quite the opposite. I, I'm not only exposed to cryptocurrencies rising and Bitcoin specifically rising, but I am actually very sympathetic to the project of cryptocurrencies as reorienting a, a society back to sound money principles. So I don't really have a problem with the ethos of Bitcoin uh, or even Bitcoin being a successful project. And so if you look at um, the latest hash rate of the network, it's about 65,000 petahashes. Uh, it would require 6,600 uh, megawatts to um, keep that system going. 24-7, uh, that results in about $7.5 billion a year of electricity at wholesale rates. So that's essentially the cost of electricity to society is $7.5 billion. Then you have to look at the mining rigs. Um, it would require about 4 million mining rigs to run at 65,000 petahashes. So when you calculate the cost of the mining rigs, again, if I, even if I'm being very nice to Bitcoin at $500, $600, um, you're talking about another two or three billion dollars. And the mining rigs have generally lasted for three to four years. So I was extra nice to Bitcoin. I use a six year amortization uh, schedule, depreciation schedule. And in that, in that regard, you're, you're looking at about $10 billion um, before you get into labor costs, rent costs, things like that. So, so that's your decay, that's your theta bleed in option parlance. And, and that $10 billion a year is, is owed to the miners by the owners of the coin. Uh, and so when you look at the coin, even today when it's valued at $13,000, that's about $220 billion of market value. You have a monetary system which is worth $220 billion that's costing about 4 to 5 percent a year just to perpetuate its own existence year over year. Uh, that to me is uh, worse than a, you know, any negative yielding, yielding bond because it's, it's telling you that the uh, only way this works long term is for the price to keep rising. And, and I'm not sure if you're aware, but when this thing started out, Nobody that you would have talked to uh, that was a Bitcoin evangelist or, or proponent, and, and I went back and I looked at my emails and notes, would have thought that at 65,000 petahash, the price of Bitcoin would only be $13,000. In other words, that, that level of decay relative to the nominal value of, of the coins is, is too high. Uh, it, it should have been much higher. So, so in a way, something's wrong with the design. Now, because this is the state of affairs, one has to ask themselves, what am I really doing when I'm buying a Bitcoin? Am I really buying something that's immutable? Or am I investing an amount of money to essentially buy an issuance of coins from a miner? Because the miner is literally issuing the coins and then distributing the coins through sale at an exchange. The, the miner can't buy energy from a utility company with Bitcoins. At the end of the day, the, the taxes have to be paid with a fiat currency, so you always have that uh, requirement to convert the bitcoins. So the miners mining the coins, selling them through the mechanisms of the exchange, distributing this, this, this thing, this security, this instrument, which is then bought by a purchaser. Well, what is that purchaser buying? If you have a 5% decay rate, which is implicit, it's written into the code, uh, at these prices, well, then the, the, the purchaser is essentially giving the miner a bunch of money up front in the hopes that the miner will keep running the system indefinitely. Now, when it comes to the difference between uh, an element, which is corporeal, and something like Bitcoin, what you essentially have to understand is that the element doesn't need anything other than the laws of physics to exist. Whereas Bitcoin is, a, is an abstraction, it's a system where humans come together and decide to allocate resources towards the uh, reification of this abstraction so that it continues to perpetuate into the future. If, if humans do not cooperate towards that goal, uh, that abstraction ceases to exist. Bitcoin is not being mined, it's being powered into existence. So essentially, all of these resources are being channeled into Bitcoin in a way that perpetuates its own existence. Whereas the gold itself is indeed being mined once 
And then once you mine it, it lasts forever. It survives into the future. It doesn't rely on the same miner that mined it in the past. With Bitcoin, what people are doing is essentially building computers that have to run 24-7 in the hopes that they win a puzzle. And the bigger com the computer they build, with the more power they invest, the more likely they are to win a puzzle. But once the puzzle is won and the coin is sold into the market, the owner of the coin depends on the continued mining of that miner. And so the proof of work that was expended by the miner, the historic metabolic energy, because there's certainly a lot of metabolic energy going into the production of Bitcoin historically, it's not bound to the coin that I'm holding at Coinbase or in my cold wallet. The only thing binding the abstraction to the proof of work is the miner's continued insistence to perpetuate the network into the future. It's, it's the most fundamental difference, and I really implore anyone that's watching this interview that's from the digital technology service economy that hasn't experienced the real natural world, the primary industries, to meditate on what we're saying here. Because this is ultimately where I think there's a gulf. The, the, the difference here is that you don't own something that depends on the laws of physics for it to continue to be the same thing, like gold. And, and you know, at this point, you'll often get um, some of this crazy talk, like, well, what about asteroid mining? Or what about if we discover fusion? And when they bring these nonsensical scientific theories up, they will only focus on what would happen to gold, not realizing that if you, for example, have a deus ex machina source of energy, everything else would become cheaper, including, for example, doing a 51% attack in the hashing algorithm. So everything is, is, is naturally scarce based on those Legos, those, those elements, but that relationship between the elements is fixed through time. And this is, for example, why all these myths about hoarding under a gold standard are false. This is why, for example, deflation under a gold standard is good in the Austrian tradition, where I totally agree with that. But ultimately, what we're talking about here, uh, when Barry says things like that, uh, when Bitcoin proponents talk about um, there's no difference between gold and Bitcoin. And in fact, if you're going to calculate the cost of mining Bitcoin, why don't you calculate all the costs of mining gold, storing gold, transferring gold? No, 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 no. There's a philosophical difference here that you have to appreciate. The gold is mined once, it lasts forever, its blockchain are the laws of physics. And if you want to get into these non sequiturs, suspension of laws of physics, asteroid mining, well, everything would change. I, I assure you gold would still do the best in that equation because of its natural attributes. I think in the first run pass, the regulators didn't realize how mining works and how integral it is to the process. Um, because if the miners don't continue to do this, then the hash power decreases. And if the hash power decreases, we know that it becomes a choke on the ability for the price to increase, the utility of the coin to work, the transaction speeds, everything falls apart. And in the worst case, if we're thinking about tail risks, you can get what you saw with Ethereum uh, Cl Classic recently, where you get just a full-on 51% attack. Someone comes in and, and mines a bunch of fake blocks, and then you've got to fork it again. So, so these are real issues. Um, I, I really believe the regulators have not fully wrapped their mind around it, but when they do, I think that they will ultimately um, decide that the miners are the issuers of the security and that the Bitcoin itself is clearly not this commodity. It's clearly not a currency. It's a security because, because there is a common enterprise here. I'm buying the Bitcoin because someone has made two promises to me. One, that the Bitcoin will be around in 10, 20, 30 years, and two, that if I pay this fee, I will make some sort of a return. And, and I think that I've seen things that are far less complicated than that be regulated. I could see regulators coming together and saying, look, even though these miners claim to be decentralized, and by the way, I don't believe anything is decentralized, uh, but, but if, even if these miners believe them, themselves to be decentralized, they're working in Congress in an industry uh, in, no different than a, a pricing control board. They're incentivized to work together. So in a way, they are an organization. And this organization is issuing these instruments with the intent to make a profit. 
Now they can either make a profit through uh, fees, salaries, or through appreciation, so the equivalent of like stock options or equity compensation. Well, I at least want them to disclose that when they sell these securities, there are certain risk factors. But I really think a good analog is the file sharing phenomena in the late 90s. And so when I started file sharing when I was a young boy, you know, I used to use Kazaa, and I used to use all these systems like Napster, and we've seen that entire industry uh, you know, be, be destroyed. It's, it's now a legal industry with Spotify and, uh, and Apple Music and things like that. So I, I think especially when you see something like Libra coming now, you really are making a bet with Bitcoin, which is, again, a bet that I like. I like this bet against the system. I would like to see the fiat money system brought down to its core, um, which is why I say it's a potato sack race. But, but when you own Bitcoin, the problem here is you can't just buy the Bitcoin, turn it into a bracelet and wait or hold it in your hand. You're, you're still betting on these centralized miners doing what they say they're going to do. So, yeah, I don't really think it's decentralized. And I think it's, it would be very easy. I think if you look at all the nodes, it's like 10,000 nodes. And, and the majority of the nodes are in the United States. And, and just so you know, like the, the block size is 580 gigabytes right now. So we're, that's the block height. So we're, we're, we're looking at like 10,000 computers that have a hard drive somewhere with 580 gigs on it and probably 12 mining pools or mining companies that control 51%. This would be much easier to control, tax, regulate than file sharing, uh, what they did with Napster or any of the other uh, torrent systems. I just want to reiterate that I am extremely passionate about what's going on with cryptocurrency. In fact, I believe that the greatest role cryptocurrency and Bitcoin is playing is in reminding the citizenry why it is that fiat money is flawed and why we have to revert back to a tangible commodity money standard where money has to be an embodiment of energy, of toil, of labor, of time. And I also fully admit that Bitcoin has done a much, much better job at proselytizing that message to the greater population uh, and even in academia and in Washington than gold has. Um, but I really believe, if I have to make one wager, that a few decades from now, when the story is written, the greatest contribution that Bitcoin will have made is accelerating the reversion back to precious metals. Uh, because, because when one of these things goes wrong with the abstraction, everyone that was exposed to this, um, and we know that all systems of, of, of formal logic are incomplete, so we know there's this tail risk embedded here. But when this goes wrong, I think people will ultimately say, okay, there's nothing wrong with a tangible commodity money standard, and in fact, appreciate gold's attributes far more.